Good morning. Uh, this is Scott from RedmondPhysicsTutoring.com, and in this week's office hours, I'm answering a question about short circuits. Now, I'm going to share this screen. Oh, neat. All right. I'm actually going to put that over there. And so I had a question. Um, somebody... I'm not sure I pronounce, I, I was like teaching in person better because I know I can confirm that I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but so I'm, I'm guessing Munchie Safe had asked me to solve a circuit where that has a short. And so I confirmed it's a short circuit and he's looking for a complex example to understand a short circuit easily. And one of the things that I find the most helpful is uh, to actually look at this circuit construction kit. It's a Java program from FET, P-H-E-T dot Colorado dot edu. If you just do a Google search for FET simulations, you'll come up with a whole bunch of stuff. There's, I mean, I'm focusing on physics because that's what I taught. And in this case, I'm looking at electricity, magnets, and circuits, but specifically about uh, DC circuits. So I've already started this up. And it's here. I'm just going to actually resize it to make it look a little nicer on the recording. There we go. Okay, so the way this works then, we have a bunch of different elements, battery, resistor, wire, switch. So we'll start out with the battery. Um, you can have multiple batteries, you can have light bulbs, connect them in different ways. And basically we can connect these things. So if I connect wires around like that, then I can actually drag the wires and I'm doing this because this is kind of how it would look. And look at that. Oh, we get a light bulb lighting up. And then if I remove one of these wires, it stops. And we can also add a switch, which is kind of neat. If I move the switch around, then I can connect both sides here. And then we can close the switch. <laughs> and Oh, yep, yeah, you can open the switch. And what I'm going to do then is show a sort of a, a circuit. I'm going to set something up. I'll remove a few of these things. What I would like to do is actually set this up so that, let's see, let's remove that. I would like to have multiple light bulbs and then we will look at what happens in different scenarios. So let's have three light bulbs, for example. And these light bulbs will be connected one to the other like that and they'll be connected on the other side so if i have this battery now look the light bulbs are kind of dim when i do this so what an, another thing you can do, and this models real life, is you can have multiple batteries together. And they're a little bit brighter. Remember, if I remove, extend this up, it's dim. Oh, I didn't know you could split the junction like that. That's kind of cool. I wonder, no. If I want to pull these up, I want to make a bit more space. Okay, there I have three light bulbs. I'm going to take three batteries just because I think... Oh, I thought it would connect. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I do want to move them down a bit. So you can kind of see that the light bulbs are brighter than they used to be. What's neat about this simulation, actually... Like I can actually remove this, clean it up a wee bit here. Yeah. What's neat about this simulation is that it shows things moving. Now, when we talk about, and this is a bit of a tangent from the focus of this morning's presentation, but when we talk about positive charge carriers moving through the circuit, they would go from the positive end to the negative end. And on these batteries, the positive end is up. The negative end is at the bottom. So this representation is actually imagining electrons moving because it is actually free electrons moving through the wires and through the circuit elements. All right, so let's split this junction 
And at the most basic level, I want to have a switch to turn this on and off. Okay, lights on, lights off, lights on, lights off. Now I am going to remove that wire because I want to actually make it into two wires for a specific reason. And I'm going to actually do something similar with this one. Because I'm going to set it up so that we can have a series of different connections. Because it gets complicated when you have lots of different switches. And I'm really just doing this spur of the moment. Okay, so what I can do then is I can close the first switch or the second switch or the third switch here between the lights and we'll see different things happen. And when I was teaching at the uh, at Vanya College in Montreal, there were some teachers that spoke a lot about this. And the reason is that there were it's actually counterintuitive. If you look at a problem like this and have to predict what's going to happen, it is a bit counterintuitive. But it's worthwhile thinking through, and I kind of feel badly by showing you the answers here because this actually represents things visually so nicely that hopefully it, it will really help you understand. So right now we have open switches at... I should figure out a way to label these, and I do have a way, so why don't I dig that up? We have switch A, B, and C, and I guess I'll call this switch down here switch D. So when I first close switch D, notice that the electrons flow all the way through the bottom, all the way up to on the right-hand side, and then all the way to the left along the top, and then back through the batteries. And the electrons are going through each one of these lights. None of the electrons are going through the switches. In fact, they the wires there might as well not be there because an open switch doesn't allow any current to go through it. So one of the questions is to predict what will happen to, say, the current. And here I should actually label the light bulbs. Um, hmm. Let's just have some fun. We'll call the first one Bob, then Doug. I'm from Canada. Bob and Doug are sort of... Canadian legends in a way. Bob, Doug, and Harry over there as, as the lights, just because I feel like anthropomorphizing the lights. So the the idea then, or the, the problem, is to predict what will happen to the current through each of the light bulbs and the brightness as we close different switches. And closing the switch represents a short circuit across the wire, like a sor short circuit going through that switch, essentially. So if I close the switch A, what's going to happen? I'll give you five seconds to think about it. And then we'll give it a try. We close switch A. Oh, look at that fire. That is pretty much a perfect short circuit. The, the reason is that there's no resistance going through. The only resistance is actually the internal resistance in the batteries, which is very small. So you end up with a high voltage and a very low resistance, which gives you a very high current, and that causes things to heat up. And when batteries heat up enough, there can be fire. Okay, so we don't like that. I like the representation of that. That is the, the most short circuit. What's funny is that it actually shows a little bit of light going through the bulbs, but really there would be nothing there. All right, let's try closing switch B. What do you think will happen? Do you think there'll be fire? I mean, this is just a simulation. There's no real fire. So we try it and whoa, the light bulb Bob is super bright. So that means that all of the electrons here are going through the first light bulb, Bob, and it's super, super bright. There are no electrons going to the right of this junction at the bottom here. I don't want to label all the junctions because it'll, it'll get really messy. But anyway, there are no electrons going through the light bulbs Doug or Harry. And the reason for that is that each of the light bulbs represents a resistance. And there's nothing driving. Like there's, well, there's a couple of things. There's no reason for the electrons to go through where there's a resistance when they have a, an easier path. Basically, they can go... 
I guess I'll call this junction E and then F. Uh, no, probably need a G and an H in a minute. Why not add I and J? There's no, rather, when the electrons go from E to F, they have, it's not even that they have a choice. <laughs> you can imagine they have a choice, and this idea will actually kind of lead to the right answer. Um, they have this choice where they could go through B, through this short circuit going from E to F straight through switch B, or they could go through G, I, J, and H, and then also through the light bulbs, Harry and Doug, which have a resistance, and they therefore don't allow electrons to go through as easily as they can go through the wire from E straight to F through switch B. The, that, and that's the sort of anthropomorphic representation, imagining that electrons can actually choose which way they go. In reality, they don't choose where they go. What I can do, and another thing about this is that it lets you have this sort of imaginary lab. So we have a voltmeter over here. I can actually measure the voltage at different points. So I can measure the voltage up there. Oh boy, these batteries are big. That's 27 volts. That's strange how... A single battery is, oh yeah, no, never mind. I <laughs> can't do simple math in my head. Yep, all right. So we have these seven volt batteries. If I measure the voltage across switch A, then I get 27 volts as well. Now, if I take a second, I'm going to actually keep all that labeling and switch to a highlighter. So, I don't know if I can... All right. This wire up here is one wire. So I can label that in green. The wire on the bottom that I'm going to highlight in red, remember as I'm using this color coding terminology, I can basically highlight the wires up until they reach something else. And I go all the way until it reaches either a circuit element, like the light bulb, or an open switch, or the bottom of the battery. So what, what I'm doing then is I can put the top end anywhere on the green wire, and I can put the bottom end anywhere on the red wire, and I get the same voltage. Now if I move the voltmeter off into the blue abyss over here, then I don't get that voltage anymore. But notice it's 26. Oh, for a second it was 98. 998. Well, okay, 27 volts essentially. Now if I go up here, oh well, that's interesting. Oh, I guess these are connected, and because there's zero, I would consider this a different wire, but um, because there's zero current through the light bulbs, then they have the same. Like there's no voltage drop across those two light bulbs, which would be Doug and Harry. Now, watch what happens when I close that switch and we get fire. Instead of 27 volts, we have 13.9 volts, and it actually changes depending on where I go. And so that's because in some internal model within this thing that is actually modeling the internal resistance of the batteries, and it's changing the voltage. Okay, so we have this wire closed. I guess uh, if I was, I don't need to highlight. The next case then would be to open that switch. We're going to close, actually I'll go back. What happens then if I close switch C? Now current is going through Bob and Doug. So we have a short circuit between G and H now. And it's not, and we have no current going through light bulb Harry on the right. And this ends up being a different circuit again. If I highlight the bottom, remember I'm stopping at open switches. I'm stopping at circuit elements. And this really explains why there's no current going through the light bulb on the right, light bulb Harry. And so the reason there's no current going through light bulb Harry is because it's essentially connected to the same wire on both sides. The voltage drop across that light bulb is zero volts. Now the voltage drop across the three batteries is still 27. If we look at 
the first battery, we have 13.5, and it's not the battery. If we look at the second light bulb, which was Doug, All right, so if we look at the second light bulb, we have another 13.5. So the voltage from the three batteries is shared between the two light bulbs. And this third switch, switch C, is modeling the short circuit. So typically when we talk about a short circuit, we really mean something like the switch at A, where the danger from a short circuit is that you get current going through a place where there's no resistance and you get a whole lot of current going through a wire that typically isn't meant to carry that much current um, and that leads to overheating and fire often. If it doesn't lead to fire you can actually get still burning like you can burn elements on small circuits like computer boards. I can remember as a kid playing with my computer and realizing at one point that there was this thin tendril of smoke rising up from the circuit board and that was the end of that motherboard. Um, so it doesn't mean that, you know, it's burning houses down kind of fire, although that can happen with poor wiring. But what it means is that there's a lot of current going through a place that wasn't designed for a lot of current, and it almost always causes problems in the circuit. So in this case, if we just wire the bulbs all together and we have no short circuits, then they all share the current and you get the same current going through each and we have nine volts and we'll see that we have nine volts going through each light or across I should say each light bulb. So if we have nine volts across each bulb then they're equally bright. Then as soon as I produce a short circuit somewhere in the circuit then the current will flow through that instead. It's basically allowing the current to flow through some part more easily than what it was originally flowing through. All right, so Munchie, I hope that answers your question. I will totally understand if it doesn't, because and if you have a clarifying question or if there's a particular circuit that you're struggling with, then please point that out to me and I'll uh, try to explain it a bit better. In the meantime, that's it for me this week and I wish you good luck with physics.